Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel called Zana Reacts where I learn all things Bharat with your help and I just share my Slovak Central European point of view and in today's video uh, we're going to look into the Runview show. Um, there's a GSI Deepak, I think that is. And I think it's one of the latest Runview show that's been requested. So I'm excited to, to review that uh, together with you guys. But before we get into the video, please like this video and click on the subscribe button and turn on the notification. Thank you so much for your support. Okay, so uh, the JSI is apparently an advocate for Hindus. He's been invited to run your show. It is a very long podcast, and I will speed it up to 1.25. Uh, I will make it two parts, even though I still believe even with that speed, it will be quite long. Um, so I say, let's go that laugh at the start of the podcast. I've never heard J. Sai Deepak laughing. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Usually happens to Mr. Tharoor. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> What's up, man? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? You're actually a normal guy. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> Social media gives you all these illusions and pretensions, but I'm just otherwise the other guy. <laughs> yeah, on, yeah, on screens, I feel like uh, if someone cuts you open, blood won't fall, some fire will come. <laughs> <laughs> so being a lawyer, I think sometimes what happens is, uh, regardless of your sign, you're fundamentally a Gemini. Oh, okay. Because you have two faces to you. Hmm. One is the lawyer face and the other is the non-lawyer face. Okay. So, and if you happen to be a litigator, plus someone who is trained in Delhi and who lives in Delhi, Aakta <laughs> <laughs> Man, okay. How would you... I love it. I'm Gemini myself. Introduce yourself to people who have no idea who you are and there's very few of them watching this podcast. Right. You've been the most requested guest literally probably since year one and we're in year four. Okay. okay. So, two questions. One, how do you introduce yourself? Right. Two, why are so many people lusting over you, Jay <laughs> <laughs> so I am a practicing advocate who practices as an arguing counsel before the Supreme Court of India and the Delhi High Court. I'm a commercial litigator out and out. So about 85% of my work revolves around intellectual property law, competition law, indirect taxation, insolvency, corporate litigation, competition law. So it's practically, let's call it the most forensic aspects of commercial litigation. Mm -hmm. Forensic aspects, aspects of commercial litigation. Okay, wait, break down each of those words for 13 euros. Sure. <laughs> so assume for a moment, uh, let me do a compare and contrast exercise. Sure. So the rest of the 15% is constitutional law and international law. Okay, out of the 100% split. Constitutional law, what is that uh, you fly at 60,000 feet, human rights, okay, public interest, government, so on and so forth. Commercial litigation, facts documents, comma, punctuation, correspondence, contracts, right? When you combine both, the mix is very different, okay? Very few people straddle the commercial world as well as the constitutional world. Because the constitutional world is more, it tends to be slightly more activist -y. Okay. People are constantly talking of just people. Whereas in the commercial litigation, you talk money, you talk reputation, you talk companies, corporations, so on and so forth, right? So what happens is when you start looking at uh, a commercial litigation, Sometimes law is not what you're focusing on. What do companies typically do? This is the end goal I wish to reach. Iska rasta kaise hoga? Aur beech mein red lags kya mm. Okay, that's how the decision process actually flows. Mm. So when you do that, you're expected to be very, very careful about what you say. Every comma makes a difference. Okay? So that is what I mean by forensic litigation. Let me give you a simple example. Some of the finest constitutional laws in this country were not and are not hardcore constitutional practitioners. Mm. Sri Nani Palkiwala was a tax lawyer who made the jump to constitution later. Mm. Because tax law involves a certain elements of constitutional law. And when he realized that he understood this better than most people, he made the switch. Okay. And because he understood taxation so well, which requires extensive amount of foreign reading, the definition of a salary is about five pages mm. in the, under the Income Tax Act. So when you bring those kind of skill sets to constitutional law, you are something else. Okay. Mr. Harish Salve is a chartered accountant turned commercial lawyer turned constitutional lawyer and who now is entirely into arbitration. He practices out of London. So when these people look at constitution, let's say level yellow hota hai. So I think it's always better if you have certain hardcore commercial skills and then you try and transpose them onto constitution. You know, mm -hmm. I totally hear you and I'm with you with right. every word. Right. I don't know if the audience is with you <laughs> at this point. Uh, you're talking on a very high level. That's the feedback for the first book. So I'll bring it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, we can go to yeah, this yeah. level again. Right. Uh, why don't you answer the second question about why so many people, people go like, Let's make it a little immature, So I think uh, I've realized this based on what I've read in the comment section and other places. Uh, the unfortunate reality is about 50% of the audience is focusing on my English. Really? Yes, and I think that's sad. Okay. And 
what I would want them to focus on is the content that I bring to the table, which I think is the dire need of the hour. Not because I'm bringing it forward, but that's something that I have benefited from. And I think people should have access to it. Now I'll have to interject here based on whatever I figured through the podcast. And I've had some extremely left, so-called left-minded people right. on the show as well. Right. Okay. And I'll also give you the youth perspective. There's basically two wings that used to be called right wing and left wing. Right. Honestly, in our country, according to modern context, which I feel is the peak of any context. Right. Uh, it's actually pro-Modi government, anti-Modi government. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, the pro-Modi has exactly what you said, Indic. Anyone who is Indic is also mostly pro Modi because of the geopolitical scenarios of today in terms of there's no other leader in the country who would be able to take on China, America, Europe. There is an overlap. It's not ideal. As in? In the sense. Okay, okay. Not all Indic fans are Modi fans. Exactly. All right. We'll, we'll break that down. Right. Uh, the left is a lot of urban elite. When I go for fancy parties, it's always some um, one who studied abroad who right. will uh, even tell me, bro, you're too right wing. In my heart, personally, I do feel I'm a fence sitter. Because for me, according to what I learned through media over eight years is that it is important to a certain degree for a media professional mm. to constantly be a fence sitter. And if there's an extreme pro-Modi or extreme anti-Modi person, keep pulling them back to the center just right. in order to extract more information and more learning. So I feel I constantly make an effort to sit on the center. That's exactly where I am right now. Very open to having my perspectives shaken. Okay. Coming back to the extreme left, lots of anti-Modi stuff, right. lots of urban elite, uh, lots of people in the world of history, which is a little strange, which I mean, archaeologists, uh, people who are spokespersons for history, etc. Um, I would say all the religions other than Hinduism, some of Sikhism, Jains and Buddhists. So Muslim, Christian, primarily, some Sikhs are on that anti-Modi uh, right. side. Primarily because if you actually go and speak to them and have a lot of Christian, Muslim, Sikh friends, uh, they do feel that their status as a minority or a status as an, a person of another religion is threatened because of the current government, because of their whole CA, CAB thing, etc, etc, etc. Uh, they view Amit Shah and Modi as sort of versions of the devil. Right. Uh, they won't agree to a lot of the uh, pro-Modi uh, perspectives. Right. Uh, in fact, people on both the ends are shut completely to the other side. Often. Correct. Uh, this is the general youth picture. Correct. Now, would you correct me at any point? Like, See, there are two things. One is a lot of people hate me for what I say. Wow. They have absolutely no personal equations with me whatsoever. So it's not as if I've done any personal harm or good for them to form an opinion one way or the other. So clearly, what are they hating? What I represent or what I stand for, at least what I claim to stand for. Mm -hmm. I would apply that logic to a significant extent to Mr. Modi. Most people don't know Mr. Modi on a first-hand basis. So what is it that they are hoping or what is it that they are actually channeling their anger towards? He, according to them, represents the crystallization of Hindutva at the highest level possible, mm -hmm. political Hindutva, which is to say where State power is openly Hindu. Allow me to say this, and this is my biggest criticism, both of the left as well as the government establishment. They are, first of all, not Hindu enough. <laughs> These guys have made them look Hindu, thanks to the criticism. Because the question that you should be asking is, if a particular government is either pro or anti, the test is what? Policy. Pro, what has it done? Pro or anti, Hindu. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you should ask a question, with the question is, what has it done for Hindus to say that he's pro-Hindu? What has he done against Muslims for someone to say he's anti-Muslim? That question is never asked. So it's empty opinions being aired in the form of angst mm -hmm. without data or evidence. Because angst within media spreads faster? Faster. Any other mm -hmm. reason? No. So one, angst. And two, it's lazy research. It's okay. hard work to actually pull out the data and ask some serious questions. Okay. True. Here's a simple example. There's a very popular video during the CA uh, protests, or anti-CA protests. I think this was in Mumbai. Uh, Mr. Farhan Akhtar was participating in this, uh, in this protest. And the journalist asked, what is it about this legislation that you oppose? Explain. He had no clue. Not the first clue what the legislation was about. Not the first clue what it was meant to deliver. He said, Itne sare log pe hain, to kuch kuch to hoga. So he's saying, I'm here because there are others shouting. That's exactly how communist marches used to take place in Kerala in the 60s and 70s. So a bystander near a tea stall would be drinking tea. Some idiot would be going uh, about taking a protest marching, long live revolution, Viplav and so on and so forth. This fellow will say, I will also join. Mm. <laughs> He'll never ask the first question. Is there a basis for it? What is my position on it? Nothing. I challenge most people who think they know anything about the CA to tell me what the CA is about. They won't be able to. You know what my next question is going to be. <laughs> yeah, sure. Explain. So you see, CA has a historical context. But before I come to the long-winded historical context, I'll give the straight answer. What does it do? Previously, for a refugee from Pakistan, Bangladesh, or Afghanistan, if they wanted to apply for citizenship in this country, there were a certain set of criteria that they had to satisfy. Cut-off dates, documents, how many years they've actually lived in Bharat for them to say that they intend to live in Bharat for the rest of their lives. That period was about 11 years. That was reduced. To say, you don't need to live here for 11 years to claim or ask for citizenship. That's one. And second is, it basically says, in these countries, 
there's a marked anti non muslim persecution where non muslim minorities don't seem to be having a great time at all and the demographics are fast dwindling and with each passing day there's a serious problem now when they when they act on that and they come out with a ca the first question the people ended up asking is will indian muslims be affected by it a specific amendment to the citizenship act which is meant to facilitate faster acquisition of citizenship to refugees uska bhartiya muslimano ke sath kya lena dena hai ask yourself the simple common sensical question show me one provision from that amendment which deprives an indian muslim of his right to citizenship it doesn't it doesn't deal with that at all target audience bahar ka hai aap andar ke logon ko yahan pe ukse rahe hain i think the question is why not just apply it on the refugees and not the muslims already living here very clear answer to that in the backdrop of the two nation theory still active and kicking with partition having let's say it uh, played itself out on a religious basis i have no reason to trust a pakistani muslim i have no reason to trust a bangladeshi muslim okay pakistan was partitioned with a bloody partition 1971 okay did bangladesh say we will now march back with india no so the premise of the partition which is two nation theory that hindus and muslims cannot live together continues to be the premise for the existence of bangladesh otherwise they would have marched back we celebrate what mm. oh common bangladeshi culture bangla culture language sari food and all that none of that played a role right so therefore we are very clear about the fact that i i don't need to extend the very same benefit of doubt that i give to the indian muslim to pakistani muslims or bangladeshi muslims under any circumstances then people said what about ahmadiyas they are not seen as muslims are bhai at least thoda to history pad lo ahmadiyas were among the four most proponents of creation of pakistan you asked for it ab wahan pe ja ke aap bhugat rahe hain why should we end up inviting you back you will come back here and create the same trouble that you did when you were with us okay please go to their website of md as a pakistan their website categorically boasts that we are among the founding communities of pakistan and today we are being treated here so an internal feud between ahmadiyya muslims and non ahmadiyya muslims doesn't change the fact that you opted for a particular decision in 46 and 47 1946 and 47 why should i change my position maybe because the grandparents opted for it you're telling me that the ahmadiyya community continues or at least has no anti hindu and anti india animus today wouldn't that be at least the let's say shouldn't that be the subject of a basic study to find out what is their position today okay let's ask let's ask this question hindus and ahmadiyas are persecuted by the punjabi sunni majority of pakistanis of pakistan theek okay? hai did ahmadiyas ever find it in themselves to create an alliance with hindus and say both of us are commonly affected let's speak up for each other no the ahmadiyas continue to spew venom against hindus in pakistan okay so if 80% of this country is hindu assuming I mean, let's see naya census kya kehta we don't know it can be less than that why should i endanger the life of 80% of this country by inviting people merely to say i too am secular i too am humanitarian mujhe aisa bolne ki zarurat hi nahi hai my national interest and civilizational interest comes first everything else is secondary what's the reality of ca today in 2023 the unfortunate reality which is why i said that <clears throat> indic interest and bjp interest overlapping is just a happy coincidence it's not 100% overlap the rules have have not been notified till date at the very least to the best of my limited knowledge and decent memory six extensions have been sought from the parliament to come out with the rules to implement the ca to aapne ca to launch kar diya but aapne rules ke bare mein socha hi nahi tha my question is to taiyari kis level ki hai what is the level of your preparation and the process the entire country is discussing an issue which the government has not shown the interest to implement yet maybe because of the backlash it got in which case i would then say what strong government farm hmm. protest roll back okay. ca you haven't done this khalistani movement has been normalized and someone managed to take out a tractor parade on the 26th of january okay right the tricolor was pulled off all of this has happened punjab is again <coughs> looking at a situation where it may not be exactly the 1980s but it seems like it is hurtling towards it then i have to say what strong government this is exactly where my disagreements come and my criticisms come so the good part is that i am not part of a choir which is constantly singing in praise of anyone okay i'm clearly saying give credit where it's due okay. mm -hmm. all right but also disagree and point out the mistakes okay Cool. I I heard like everything you said, and uh, I'm going to give some of my own perspective here. Please correct me wherever you think I'm going wrong. Sure. Okay? This is from the perspective of extracting even more information. Right. Uh, and I'm also going to go one layer deep and say two things. Right. The one thing I've learned over my career is that data is the new oil. If you follow data and if you follow facts and figures, you will get growth, which is true. And at some points in this whole journey with data, I noticed that no, at some point you have to trust your intuition with certain decisions also right. in terms of what is the human angle of this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, which has led to some very good decisions in my own career. Right. So I've begun to trust a, a version of data meets intuition. That's one thought. Perfect. The second thing I'd like to bring in is that we had a, a Tibetan monk on the show recently who explained Buddhism to me. Okay. Buddhism has a lot of similarities with Hinduism, and the more you kind of go to the depths of Buddhism, you realize, oh, this is very similar to us. Mm. 
he said that the one difference that he feels is Buddhism is centered first and foremost around altruistic thought, hmm. which means that when they say Oh, money, padme ham, hmm. you're praying for the welfare of every sentient being, hmm. including animals, including whales, including right. fish, including insects, right. including humans of other faiths. Right. That stayed with me a lot after all these podcasts we recorded. Right. And I feel I've become even more empathetic since I've started chanting, since I met him, right. because every podcast rubs off a certain energy. Okay. Uh, which again makes me think that even with a decision like this. My opinion is that you should include some amount of intuition and see what the overall effects on the morale of mm. the overall country are. Right. And while maybe, see, I'll, I'll never be able to argue with you as a lawyer about you know keeping facts and figures in mind. You can. I don't want to. <laughs> 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 but, uh, uh, I'm not a journalist, dude. Right. I'm a YouTuber. I'm a podcast. I'm right. also learning. Right. Right. What I will say is that you're the most. Uh, I mean, I hate using the word because you don't like it, but you're the most right person I've uh, uh, had on the show. Like no right. one has come on the show till now and said, no, the government's not doing enough. Correct. Like you're the first person who's sort of pro Modi, but it's also pulling right. it further in that direction. Everyone is kind of on the central side, some right. My point is, maybe I've learned this through business and through managing human beings, right. that even morale is a thing within the country. Right. And I'm also keeping present geopolitical scenarios in mind. Right. Uh, you would have Genghis Khan, right? So, I mean, why the f*** am I asking? <laughs> 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 Genghis Khan right. uh, grew up in Mongolia, right. where he was at war with other Mongolian tribes. Right. His until... wife was kidnapped. Sorry? His wife was kidnapped. Yeah. Right. He, he saw a lot of atrocity because of the local civil wars where tribes used to face each other. Right. Eventually, when he took over the country, he knew that there's still going to be wars. There right. was a sort of inherent divide and rule mentality there as well. Right. So he said, that, no, instead of fighting with each other, hmm. let's coagulate, let's become one, and then go out and conquer Asia. Right. That's the power of bringing multiple human beings of multiple faiths and multiple subjective realities together right. and giving an external kind of motive. Right. The one thing I've learned about geopolitics is that it's very money driven. So the richer you are as a country, right. the more geopolitically powerful you are. Correct. The world is sort of beginning to be at war constantly now. Right. We need to first develop our armor. We need to develop our weaponry for which we need to become rich, for right. which the morale of the country has to be good. Right. For which my opinion is that Mohammed Sarraj should be in the same team that Shikhar Dhawan bats for. Agreed. So that's why I'm not fully in agreement with you. Right. But please correct me. So it's like this. One of the finest human beings that I've had the good fortune of engaging with is Sri K.K. Mohammed. Hmm. Okay. And my regret is I could not interact with Sri Abdul Kalam. These are examples that I'm very comfortable with. And these are people who I genuinely feel warm towards. Okay. Sri K.K. Mohammed, notwithstanding his name, is among the few people who renovated temples. The Pateshwar Temple in Madhya Pradesh when he was with the ASI. And someone who was upfront and candid about the impact of Islamic invasions in Bharat. Okay? To my mind, that's honesty, wherein the current generation is not carrying the baggage of the past. You say somebody may have done it. I don't agree with it. And I don't wish to relate to it in any way. The problem is those who seek association with the conqueror of the past are making the conqueror an existing reality of the present. Okay? And that's where the problem starts. Okay? Then the wounds fester. So you're saying Muslims are chill as long as they have Indian identity intact in their hearts today, right. but you should, shouldn't celebrate things like Mughal invasions or, uh, you know, the whole, the kind of shit we're taught in history books. This is not me saying actually. So I have several disagreements again with Dr. Ambedkar, but one of the uh, finest things that he has said in Pakistan or partition of India, in the opening chapters, he's asking the basic question, what makes a nation a nation? He starts with the theoretical basis and then asks whether India is two nations within one. Can it survive as a single nation? Because he's writing this in 1946, when Pakistan has become a reality. Okay, so he's asking this question. Congress is trying desperately to say, no, we can represent both interests. Muslim League says, sorry, not happening. Ambedkar is asking Congress to get real. And he says, you have never existed as a single nation, Hindus and Muslims. So please don't kid yourself. And he speaks in perhaps as politically incorrect a language as possible from today's terms or from today's perspective. And he's bloody clear about this. He says, what you define as a nation is, you have common heroes, common villains, which is, in group ka definition be common hai, out group ka definition be common hai. Who belongs to us and who doesn't? Both these definitions are crystal clear. Oh. And you have a largely shared vision of the future. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have a shared vision of the past, kahe ka rahega bhai future? Right? Until 1920s, nobody thought that there would be a partition of Bharat. There was increasing clamor. But it's only after Khilafat it started really taking a lot, it started getting a lot of traction. Because the beast had been unleashed, which mm -hmm. was waiting for an opportunity. Okay? Mm -hmm. So when all of this exists, I am asking myself, what part of this position, extreme or non-extreme, is different? Is A, historic, or lacks basis in history, okay. or in lived experience? Okay. That's one. Two, I'm 100% with you. Given the geopolitics, the increasingly volatile geopolitics of the world, 
where interestingly Bharat is poised to play a good role, right? Why would you want to create trouble with him? Well, I don't want to. I'm I'm not interested in it at all. Anyone who is doing well for himself or herself has zero interest in creating trouble, because peace makes it all possible, mm. right? It's not as if I need trouble for me to thrive. You're saying the media has fueled these Hindu fear narratives, which Muslims and Christians and minorities have adopted. Therefore, there's a lack of peace. Media is just one convenient punching bag. I significantly blame and squarely blame the left. Okay, which is all the people who meet at parties, college kids, the academics, mm -hmm. the Marxists, specifically the Marxists, yeah. their historiography and their al alignment of interests has always been with the worst of examples from the non-Hindu communities, not with good examples. The left never celebrated Dr. Kalam as long as he was alive. The left till date does not celebrate Sri K.K. Mohammed because he was clear about the position of Ram Janbhumi. Because as an ASI director, he knew what he was talking about. The evidence was, in, was speaking to him, right? So I've always said this, remove the left from the conversation between the Hindus and Muslims. You'll have a much more honest conversation. Okay. Because the left feels demonization, or rather feeds demonization, and the left also feeds victimization. Mm. It happens at both ends. Fair. What's the future of Muslims and Christians in India? I would say that Kerala Muslims today have realized that their safety lies in having a significant Hindu population so that they can survive without any trouble. Safety? Yes. Kerala Christians have realized this because they're seeing the increasing radicalization of Kerala. For the first time in several decades, uh, Christian pastors have clearly said, we need to have Hindu neighbors. If I had said this, I'd be accused of all sorts of things. Well, they're saying this. And they're basically saying that the grooming that's happening is not limited only to the Hindu community that's happening even within the Christian community. The kind of grooming that you see of Pakistani gangs in, in UK, that's something that's being replicated in Kerala. I would use the word sexual grooming and religiously profile sexual grooming. What right? sexual grooming? Yes. You mean they're seducing Hindu girls? I would say there is a very clear uh, data. And recently the retired, uh, let's say, cop from Madhya Pradesh, who's a sickening for that matter, ended up making the statement that I've seen this as part of my own career, that there were rate cards being distributed as to what is the price of a particular girl or what is the price of securing a particular girl. This is commoditization of women. It should actually be a priority for feminists, right? So the point is, safety of Bharat or the way forward is in preserving its accommodating character. And that character will be preserved only if it remains Hindu majority. Okay. And you have reason to believe it's not going to remain Hindu majority. I have no reason to believe one way or the other. I just know for a fact that in at least uh, over 100 districts out of 775 districts, there is a very clear demographic imbalance. I've hinted at the importance of, not hinted, I've spoken of it, of the importance of demographic balance in the second book, where I showed the populations of each of the provinces and which are the provinces which are actively batting for Pakistan. It's a game of population and numbers. Okay. Because you're a lawyer and an engineer, I'm, saying, I'm assuming that everything you're saying is backed on like research, facts. The tables, tables from that particular period, the census of that particular period, captures the total population in each in each province and the Muslim population in each province. I have cited this. I have not generated data. I have captured the data from existing primary authentic sources. Okay. Okay. And so far, the book was launched on the 23rd of August, 2022. No one has been able to count to me on facts. Okay. One last question in this segment. What do you see as the way forward? Bharatiya Karan of our thought processes. When? Which is, as uh, Dr. Ambedkar said, if conversion to a different faith has the consequence of alienating you from your own roots and from Bharat, then it poses a significant threat to the long-term interests of Bharat. So we are told that there is this mythical creature called Indian Islam. I'm saying let it become a reality. We're all safe. Okay. I'm saying let Ganga Jamani Tehzeeb, which is constantly spewed and spouted on, let it become a reality. This takes nothing away from practices of Islam, like going to the masjid, no, doing namaz. No, no, no. Those are perfectly fine. See. But you're saying just accept uh, history in the same way that many Hindus accept history today? There are three requirements. One, okay. accept the fact that neither of these Abrahamic faiths are native to Bharat. And the culture of this land is significantly informed by its native faith systems. Mm -hmm. And therefore, also be slightly more empathetic or sympathetic. Empathy is not possible because you're not in the same position. Sympathetic to the fact that this is an imposed faith. Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. a lot of them are converts. That is a reality. Now, whether they want to come back or not, I don't think it's, it should be a matter of imposition or coercion. That should be left to people's choice. That should be left to their own free will. However, it shouldn't come to a point where the native faith system is struggling to find gasps of breath. Okay. So, Mr. Vajpayee's ashes 
were refused cremation or they weren't they weren't allowed to be uh, i'd say uh, uh, immersed in rivers in the northeast because the majority communities in the northeast said sorry this can't happen this is anti christian or anti christian so in bharat you can't immerse ashes of your former prime minister and you're telling me that's okay mm. think about it right why should the death of a mafia uh, don result in victimization or perceived victimization of the community to which apparently this man relates to or uh, is, mm. is is from okay. what kind of elements are you really celebrating mm. there are better, better examples pop culture academia politics there are better people surely it can't be our argument that this is the best possible example to be held up as role models okay so many tangents to go on now in order to move forward uh, we have a round called ajio presents keep it casual okay. uh, i'm not going to ask you anything intense that's a lie there are some intense questions okay uh, so let's hit it everybody okay say deepak are you ready yes please so ajio keep it casual <laughs> okay you can't think too long but i will ask you some tangential questions sure is jay say deepak a good guy trying to be bad or a bad guy trying to be good neither you know a lot of people say neither but mm. in truth it always boils down somewhere on that scale <laughs> so i will put you let's just say it's an evolution towards the better so you're a bad guy trying to be good possible yeah i'm a bad guy trying to be good you ever read harry potter i have okay uh i think everyone wants to be a gryffindor when they're right, growing up right. and then they eventually realize that oh maybe there's more sense in being a slytherin in right. this big bad world right um and the other two houses just exist <laughs> so i would definitely say i'm a slytherin a good hearted slytherin mm. Uh, what house would you put you yourself in? I'd certainly uh, subscribe to the out of box thinking and the adventurism of Slytherin, mm. uh, hoping for uh, acquisition of the values of Gryffindor at some point mm. and the work ethic of Hufflepuff. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> okay, talking about Hufflepuff. <laughs> okay. What does Jaisai Deepak do to chill, and what does he wear on such a day? Shorts, uh, tees. Uh, I love colorful practice. Colorful by two. Yeah. So it's, really, it's grown on, and it's something that. I realized is a fantastic way to unwind. What is that practice? Please do let me know in the comments. For the people who don't know, Kalari Paiyatu is just explain. So Kalari Paiyatu is uh, a martial art form which uh, traces its origins to what we know as Parashurama Kshetra, which is from Konkan to Malabar, and therefore it's now largely associated with Kerala. It has a northern tradition and a southern tradition, and uh, I'm being uh, uh, educated and taught by people who are fantastic at this, by uh, members of the Hindustan Kalari Sangam, which is based out of Cochin, which is one of the organizations banned by the British early on. and then they were reestablished why was it banned martial arts okay it, it could make someone aggressive no no they clamped down on the ownership of arms and performance and let's say teaching of martial arts because they were scared of the repercussions of it okay judo was the most important thing in my life in my childhood okay. channelized all my aggression okay what has kalari paitu done for you now one is uh, uh it gives a flow because it is part choreography and part martial arts okay and the first few years like mr miyagi what you're taught is a series of uncoordinated steps the beauty is when all of them come together you realize the importance of each of the broken down steps that you've performed okay so it helps you enmesh everything together the building blocks come beautifully together and two uh, it also teaches you humility there's a reason for it uh, see the thing is someone who thinks of himself as fundamentally mental in the sense that he operates in the intellectual realm or like something that has got to more with the mind and we have a tendency to put this in uh, let's say in boxes if you're physically you're not mentally if you're mentally not physical those boxes are broken thanks to performance or let's say training in martial arts because it is both it requires you to be flexible it requires you to have stability balance and what not and also constantly think self awareness to a point where you know exactly what you're doing and then it becomes part of your muscle memory mm. right it makes you very sharp it makes you very agile and it's a great stress buster so i love it okay cool when do you feel the most alive or purposeful and why uh when i'm on my feet arguing in a court of law yeah. uh, especially when i'm making an argument which is uh not immediately acceptable and when i'm trying to persuade perhaps an audience which is otherwise not agreeing with me okay mm -hmm. that is a high which is irreplaceable very short offshoot question you know when you were talking about the whole ca thing and i said that but the intuitive side is this does that intuitive side come into being a lawyer huge like you have to give a human intuitive so one is the intuitive aspect where you try and make it uh, human that's there but the second is you see it's not just about files facts and the law your ability to read the room to read the person sense the air to understand which way the wind is blowing as you argue because literally when an argument goes on a connection is established between the audience and the the spokesperson or the speaker and you can feel that live wire as you argue that's what an arguing counsel or let's say someone performs the role of a barrister brings to the table so in the legal profession you have broadly two distinctions one is the solicitor who handles the client prepares the strategy files drafts and everything 
he then engages the services of an arguing counsel who is used to exclu- exclusively argue in court mm. okay so his job is to ventilate he's the dog who barks in court put it crudely he is the one who is the face there but this person's strength is to say you're very attached to your facts you're not able to look at it from a third party perspective mm. Mm. and second you may have 25 points to present but you don't know how to uh, let's say prioritize it if you have only half an hour and you have 30 points to make the expectation from an arguing counsel is choose the top 5 bullets from the 30 and make it simple enough for the person to understand mm. because it could be taxation it could be competition what not mm-hmm. right so that is when uh, your your intuitive and your instinctive side actually play a huge role in understanding the reading of the room you know mm. why you may go to a particular script and then you realize ye yahan pe kaam hi nahi karega you'll get to know that in the first 30 seconds then from the 30 bullets you have chosen 5 you drop these 5 you pick up the next one mm. okay there quick thinking on your feet that's amazing that's something you, i enjoy macro salesman you could say that you could say that mm, wow okay never looked at law in that way dude because honestly i think before i met lawyers through the show which is advocate prareep rai and yourself i thought you all are really boring <laughs> so and now i realize you're full of like fire and spice too you love the profession once you get into it and i'm telling you no drug can come anywhere close to the chaska that litigation can give you yeah yeah i i hear you now <laughs> as a 29 year old right. with, with some perspective but it's just that engineering is so much cooler right. media is so much cooler right so uh, i'm changing my opinion right in fact talking to you probably i want to extract more of that cool side of law but we'll get into that right don't think too long about this one five things you would do as the pm of the country uh first thing is revisitation of the constitution from an indian perspective to uh perhaps uh, what the government is already doing in terms of clearing the weed from the colonial establishment number of laws which are unnecessary that's one three i would want to inculcate a certain sense of discipline in the youth by mainstreaming some part of services in the armed forces ooh israel style not fully a conscription style but uh, the agnipath model in a slightly more uh, mm. let's say uh, fashion where it becomes accessible to even people in schools okay in the 11th and 12th okay that would be one way of looking at it because having been to israel i've seen how it actually works it's fantastic that model has worked it's yeah, yeah. three uh, four seriously revisit our education system uh, from multiple perspectives uh, it's people usually think of only history when they think of education but there's a lot more to it your approach to science and your approach to reason tarkashastra all these aspects of indic logic and reasoning have to be introduced five uh, free temples from state control across the board what is state control they collect the money that are temple not just collect the money they appoint officers who run the establishment as if it's a bureaucratic establishment and do what and do what budgets they clear the budgets they interfere with rituals single handedly responsible for changing the traditions in multiple major temples like jagannath puri and what not or even tripathi for the matter single handedly responsible for treating temple as a port of revenue as opposed to what it is not meant to be as opposed to let's say a place of worship or a place of spiritual solace right gotcha. you've reduced religion to religious tourism that's not what it was ever meant to be for mm. and it is meant to also act as a community support system where it provides money it's also a guild in a certain form right provide education to people if you're looking at the arguments relating to reservation you can perhaps offset it to a significant extent if you say the temple money will be used to educate people from the depressed classes for a certain period of time mm. you're giving a positive replacement mm. otherwise the reservation argument will always be about oh you're taking this away you can never take something away once you've given it mm. especially in the realm of reservation so you give alternatives okay and look at this is very entrepreneurial dude sorry like these are entrepreneurial thoughts right right any anyway, does that fascinate you like being an entrepreneur no not at all no why not uh, because i'm way too much in love with my profession to think of anything else outside of it okay you'll be a lawyer for as long as you can until i'm burnt really yes. you wouldn't want to get into politics never i'm not cut out for it because you can't play the game of thrones that's one and two you have to realize that their orders of uh, thinking is vastly superior actually they are not idiots politicians are supremely intelligent creatures who understand larger audiences and scale of audiences which we can't i am catering to at best an educated audience of a particular kind it's easy because it's right up my alley because of my qualification in the subject i'm talking about they have to talk about so many things they have to meet so many people their ability to read people is like this right a brilliant taar lenge dur se aapko and all of this comes by being part of this establishment from your early years it's like swimming and horse riding you can't learn it after 40 because there's a fear factor that sets in right so you need to be able to understand this ecosystem better so politics is not and i can't do ji huzuri anywhere okay too much of an outspoken person to actually do that mm. i'd rather engage with the society than be interested in power games anywhere else okay cool um when most <laughs> people actually accuse me of having political aspirations i don't yeah in the next question slightly <laughs> in that tangent but it's a fun question okay if you were to start a political party name five celebrities you like to start it with and why one of the most well read celebrities i have come across and whose knowledge was astounding one because i was surprised and also there was truly some depth is pawan kalyan the actor uh, chiranjeevi's brother 
okay who himself runs a party i would certainly want to consult him on a few things he knows the ground realities of andhra and telangana better uh, the other person that i'd certainly want to bring on board uh, is someone from the commercial sector so from the past there is mr mahalingam uh, who runs or rather who's uh, who's conglomerate has uh, sugar industries and what not his lectures at the ramakrishna mission is something i grew up on in, in my engineering days because he was the first person to tell me about that energy centers in latin america which is spoke of mm. and he was also uh, he had also been uh, ele- an elected member of the madras legislative assembly at that time so he is one person i look for more people who are from the heartland not from the urban elites because indian native intelligence has actually no substitute it's among the sharpest in the world i would say that so these are the two celebrities the others i can't really think of and uh, i might as well say this uh, annamalai from the bjp the tamil nadu bjp president he's brilliant is a rising star for all sorts of reasons which are popular but he's a truly a thinking leader and the way he's changing the landscape of tamil nadu politics is astounding okay cool uh lots of questions on this in the next section right this this round allows me to navigate through the conversation much better all right um again coming back to the world of films are you a film guy by any oh yes okay. huge film guy all right whose style do you admire the most from the world of films and why jimmy stewart okay uh a very human laid back soft approach to acting you can actually relate to him one of the finest movies of his that i watched of course most people uh, uh, think of that movie where uh, uh this it's a movie about christmas i don't remember the name exactly but uh, anatomy of a murder is a movie that i would recommend you so- strongly watch okay cool it is perhaps the best possible movie to understand trial litigation how cross examination happens in the context of a murder and with two scintillatingly brilliant actors who literally exuded a loyally presence on screen and it is taught in american law schools to understand trial litigation because it comes closest to real life cross examination okay absolutely brilliant the brains that's been used there is great and the other movie is uh, spencer tracy's uh, uh, it's on the the scope controversy on darwinism versus intelligent design this controversy happened in the early 50s and 60s so this m- movie is based on that where in the bible belt they did not want people to teach darwinism and evolution mm-hmm. so that movie is so rather the episode becomes the basis of this movie okay any indian 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 movies indian movies or indian celebrities hmm. and also about the style so tamil hasan before he became an uh, became a politician i'd say he shouldn't have done this squandered everything one is he's a once in a generation actor okay he squandered it thanks to his foray into politics and now everything that he does is political uh most people actually think mani ratnam's finest movie is roja i would say no his finest movie is nayagan because it brought together kamal hasan and mani ratnam okay and the magic is it's it's not been recreated again all right who's a perceived left wing spokesperson that you'd be happy to sit down and learn from uh i actually would want to have a conversation with noam chomsky tall order i mean he's a giant and all that but he is a person i'd like to speak with because i've been watching some of his videos okay a lot of things that he says about the west are some things that would apply uh, to our perception of the west and yet his position on india and kashmir and so on and so forth is deeply problematic that may be because he's been fed information by arundhati roy and others left uh, to himself and if he had done his own research i suspect he may have come to a different conclusion about bharat but he is one person i'd like to engage with you have any indian names mm. indian names from the left one not at all no. who do you like to see me interact with um no. have you had mr tharoor dr tharoor not yet you should okay because uh, uh for multiple reasons i don't agree with him on almost everything okay <laughs> but i would certainly say that uh, he is a dignified debater okay and he is very decent to engage with not commenting on anything else i'm not giving a clean sheet on anything okay and uh, the operative word being anything but uh it was fun to engage with him and he did not have any qualms or ego in engaging with me in a debate mm. uh and even asked for a signed copy of my book at the end of it okay so i would say that is one and i had equal fun as a moderator engaging with uh, uh, barrister asaduddin waisi okay yes i want to have him on the show as well you should okay. five things that will not be present in india in 10 years time it won't be a party based election anymore it will be a presidential style election like people yes. will be voting for people people will be voting for individuals okay we are looking at that that's one two uh, i would actually assume that we'll be less of a car economy and more of a public transport economy rich people will use public transport i would say so we are moving in the direction gradually people are realizing the trouble of having to maintain a car yeah uh, everyone my age uses uh, cabs and metros correct three we will be forced to revisit our disrespect for environment very serious okay. ways yeah water problems yeah okay we are looking at it big flaw of the current government 
it is one of my major criticisms of the government yeah. all over the country you go to himachal same problem bombay same problem and they're going to see floods i don't like traveling to himachal because of the destruction on the path yeah see i understand the importance of infrastructure but i think we need to strike a balance uh four is the left will no more remain cool you think it's cool right now it is still i think it's uh, there's a point of inflection yeah. we are going through that point of inflection but the current de facto respect that they enjoy in certain circles may not be the case anymore because they're exposing themselves very badly by not researching enough by not researching enough in the age of internet and by not actually dealing with facts by just still only spouting opinions five the exodus of talent from bharat will come down brain drain will reduce significantly it's already happening possibly people will come back the, the reverse is happening a lot of people are actually writing to me saying how do we be part of this party now because india seen as a big party now yeah challenges are there lifestyle changes are going to be very difficult if you live in a first world country come to bharat and you have a lot of issues here you still will go through all of that but they want to be a part of a journey where they get to contribute to it as opposed to being mm. part of an established story yeah being an engineer seeing the caliber of my friends who are working abroad it's one of my motivations as an entrepreneur here to be able to be basically really rich and then either fund or co-found really large scale shit with the guys who left because they are actually maybe talent wise the same as some of the guys who left behind but experience wise there's no comparison right you're playing in the nba versus playing in an indian basketball league right. even if the talent levels are the same you're playing against lebron james you haven't there. competed against the best yeah Correct. so these guys are picking up skills but and this way this post 1990 born a uh, generation of indians a lot of them will come back because they'll understand that okay you can make money here as well and the parents need them correct basically. correct and they are missing out on being part of all the festivals and the family yeah. occasions see more that na yahan ka na wahan ka correct um plus the west is not what it was before yeah. the american dream is no more what it was mm. europe standards are terrible now mm. several so called advanced european countries are not worth living in yeah. right because of their inability to deal with the migrant population yeah. right that's a huge issue they don't know how to handle the uh, impromptu riots like the leicester riots they don't know because it's something that we have lived with we have dealt with they haven't right so considering that uh, they're looking at two things if i can make even 60 to 70% of what i'm making there plus i get to live with my parents and there is a cultural bonding here and i get to be part of a growth story what ex- exactly is the state of plus if you have children and young children the support system in bharat is irreplaceable right both in terms of getting professional support or family support one you have to do everything on your own from mm-hmm. dishwashing to everything mm-hmm. what do you do mm-hmm. yeah i think a few things are there. i will just stop it right here because this has been a really long video um very very interesting for me i actually made some notes but i think one thing that really um the the chuck me was the the the, the thing uh about sexual grooming wow and um, but when he said about indians having an accommodating character and that the christians can only survive when they have hindus around that was actually very uh, very interesting and i um you know and i just wonder is it because of your accommodating nature i'm just looking at my notes is it because of your accommodating nature that you believe that bharat has so many minorities there are different cultures etc uh within that do do you reckon this this is kind of what this is because then he talked about indian islam and i'm not too sure i really understood what he actually meant like um i i kind of understood it from the point where i i thought in in different videos i talked to you about the fact that you know let's say lutheran religion in slovakia is different to uh lutheran the religion in germany etc so they, there might be actually practices uh, that are slightly different might be similar but slightly also different so you feel like you're in a different kind of religion type of thing so this is kind of what what strikes me in my head but i'm not too sure what the indian islam is actually really really meaning um in this context so if you could please enlighten me in the comments i would be super uh, super helpful and um uh yeah it, it's and he was at the very start of the podcast talking a lot about pol- and and I think I mentioned it in another video uh but to me it really feels that you're really looking into is this right wing is this left wing and everything has to be compartmentalized for some reason and this is where you know I don't appreciate with people like try to call me something when I explain to millions of times that I don't care about, about politics I'm a, a political but um but it feels like there is this strong need to to really have that political like sticker on every single thing which i can't quite comprehend so if you could let me know 
um, that would be in my guess is because of the degree of development. I don't think, let's say, if, you, if I give you an example of, of here, I wouldn't label policies maybe in the government. Yes, of course, you have whatever parties, but I wouldn't, it's just, I, I don't know how, how, I find it hard to explain. I don't think anyone thinks about it. Like an ordinary person doesn't go around and think about it. You are the left wing person. You are the right wing person. This is why you must be bad, right? Bad, left, bad. Woo. That doesn't happen, you know, and you guys think completely different. It feels like you think through the lens of politics and it might be, and that's just my assumption. And I would love to, if you could correct me, it's because of their, it, it, it the the country hasn't yet kind of come together and, and solidified maybe that's the word I'm looking for uh, it is just we don't think and act in a way from what I've noticed at least judging from the comments you do it's it's a completely foreign concept to me I wouldn't you know obviously in politics but in day-to-day -day life when I'm discussing let's say school politics let's let's just take education for example i have never heard anyone calling like this is a left-wing politics or this is a right-wing politics never never it this concept just simply does not track here so this is why you know like when you let's say trying to even understand what i'm saying or vice versa it's also about, you know, this is why I'm highlighting these things because culturally, and I've been saying this for the longest time, and I think the more I know, the, obviously the more I don't know about India, that the culture is so vastly different. And I also have been told by someone that apparently left and right in India is, is different to what it is in the West. So can you imagine what kind of chaos that can create in someone's head? But it just feels like, it, it, it just so remotely different to hear. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I would love, I would love to know. Um, and also it was, uh, it was interesting to, to hear about his predictions for the future about, uh, you know, uh, thing, people, especially young people coming back um, and helping to build a country. I, I find it, you know what, when I did come back, at the start of COVID and I worked for a Slovak kind of startup. It was a Slovak, but they have a PO box. This is how they do things here. To be American, they just like buy themselves a PO box in, in the Silicon Valley. And I did not feel that they were, you know, appreciative or even understood my skill set to help them. And I wonder uh, if that could be also maybe the case in the future. I feel like Indians, from what I've gathered, might be way more open-minded. Uh, I didn't come to this. I, I, I was like, yeah, I would love to contribute to my own country, my own economy, because obviously I studied for the most part, although I did like a stint, uh, you know, uh, I was an Erasmus student in the UK once. But for the most of the part, you know, this comp this country fed me, you know, you know, I and, and I feel that that you know what the guy has mentioned that I wanted to to give back, but I was not like I don't know. I don't think uh, maybe that's the way to say it. I don't think it was welcome or appreciated, which at least that's the mentality here, and I know it's not just me. So that you know, you feel. I was like, you know what, what am I even doing there, here? You know, I can F off back to, to the UK and I know I will be valued and appreciated there, <laughs> you know. Uh, say, say about discrimination as much as you want about the, the English and I've experienced this myself, but I've been valued by very many English people, uh, you know, in the big businesses. So, you know, it's kind of like, what 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 you're even doing here when when you know no one is you're just actually coming from a very genuine intention but then they know better and that's the thing that you know these people here they don't play with the big boys i was in my particular industry 
I, I work for the biggest agencies that there are in advertising. So, and I keep on explaining this, that, you know, like if you have advertising centers, you have big one in London and in New York. And obviously people that work in those centers will have the best experience in the industry. Then there might be all other smaller hubs, but they will never get the same exposure um, to, to the projects, types of a business to learn, right? They will get what I, if, you know, what happens in the West is they outsource everything to India. I'm not, as a, as a director, I'm not going to outsource the most interesting piece of work to India, I simply won't. I will. Uh, I will outsource the the simple, repetitive, easy stuff that is going to, you know, like it or or, or not. What I'm saying, but this is actually what happens. They outsource the, the the kind of what I call brainless work to countries, even like Slovakia. Don't get me wrong. Same in Slovakia, India. So you have so on 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 the larger competitive scale in this particular industry. It will be very hard for you to compete. I don't know, unless you're like super duper clever, whatever you have connections. Um, but and this this is this is the thing. But here they feel a bit arrogant about their own experience. So that's Slovakia for you. I hope it's 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 a different story um, in in India. Um, but uh, I, I I really like when people want to go and you know help to rebuild the country which is super nice i know this is a bit getting really long so i just stop it here and thank you so so much for watching this video if you did enjoy it please give a thumbs up share like and subscribe to this channel and i'll see you in the next one until then please do take care i am sunny much much love bye bye